Well, good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. And welcome to the Orange County School Board's first meeting, regularly scheduled meeting of the New Year. Today is January 8th, 2019. And I want to uh, ask for anyone that has a cell phone if, here in the audience, if you'd please set it on silent so that we don't interfere, interrupt the proceedings this evening. Tonight we have a very special guest with us who's going to lead us in the moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. This is a student from Chain of Lakes Middle School, Hinella Mirabel Molina, if you'll come to the podium. Hanel is a student at the Chain of Lakes, as I mentioned, and she has made all state orchestra. She's an extremely talented violinist, and we are so proud of you, and we know that your parents who have joined you today, thank you for being here with us. We know you're enormously proud. We want to thank your, your parents because obviously they've played an important role in getting you where you are. And now if you would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence first. Thank you. Thank you, and um, my name is uh, Kevin Strang. I'm Hianella's uh, teacher. Uh, Hianella is one of our many English language learners at Chain of Lakes, so uh, she was more comfortable if I would uh, say the uh, Mormon silence and the pledge. All right. And if you would please remain standing and remove your hats for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. And Mr. Strang, thank you for your role. And if you would bring Hinella with you to the podium so that we can say... Hi, so nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you so much. There is, uh, to my knowledge, there's only one member of the school board who has had the special honor and joy of having an opportunity to listen to Hianella, and I wanted to introduce Member Gould to make a few comments about that experience. Well, first of all, if you get a chance to come to Chain of Lakes and hear the orchestra and um, in general, and especially the chamber orchestra, you are in for a treat, but Hianella is extraordinary. I'm sorry, I've lost the name of the maestro that she um, studied with in Brazil. Um, Gustav. In Venezuela? Uh, in Venezuela, yeah. Uh, the, the Youth Orchestra of Venezuela, which was started by Gustavo Dudamel. Gustavo Dudamel. So anyone who listens to classical music would definitely recognize that, that name. Um, he's, he's quite famous. But I have to tell you, that was one of the most enjoyable days that I have had while I've been on the school board. I, I had lunch with the orchestra students and then got a treat of the concert. But we just kind of had a roundtable discussion of, of the world as our middle schoolers saw it. And um, I so appreciate that opportunity to have that roundtable discussion and, and really see firsthand. And I also want to congratulate you and your parents um, for the magnificent um, work that you've put in to have the skills that you have. My youngest son is a violinist, but he can't hold a candle to you, and he's at Florida Polytech. Don't tell him I said so on this recording. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it really was such a treat. Thank you very much for being here, and thanks for having such a strong um, program. And, and it's one of the things we're proud of as board members, to have such strong arts in our school and to have students um, really excel in that is a pleasure. Thank you, Member Gould. 
All right. We also have several other uh, announcements and exciting things to recognize. But first, let me mention that we are joined in the audience by Commissioner Siplin and by her husband, Senator Siplin. Great to have you both with us. In just a minute, it will become more obvious probably to people why they're here, besides the fact that obviously they care passionately about education in our public schools. But um, they have... one other reason for being here. So with that, I wanted to um, mention that we have Senior Administrator over Athletics and Activities, Doug Patterson, here, and he's going to join us and come to the podium and introduce some pretty exciting announcements in the area of, of OCPS Athletics. Thank you, Madam Chair, school board members, and Superintendent Jenkins. The fall season concluded with some notable highlights in several sports. Edgewater football captured the 7A regional championship. The season came to an end in the FHSA state, state semifinals as they lost to undefeated Lakeland. Dr. Phillips and Wakaiva both followed up district championships with two wins in the opening round of the football playoffs. Their season ended in the regional finals. In swimming, West Orange and Winter Park finished sixth and seventh, respectively, during the FHSA girls state championships held in Stewart. Olympia's boys also finished in the top 10 with a ninth place finish. In bowling, we had individual successes. Apopka junior Ben Bailey finished as the individual state runner-up, and East River sophomore Isabel Pohl finished as an individual state runner-up on the girls' side. In cross-country, Windermere finished in sixth place with West Orange posting a 10th place finish at the FHSA Boys Cross-Country State Championships held in Tallahassee. Defending champion Winter Park posted a 10th place finish on the girls' side. In girls volleyball, West Orange girls fell just short of a runner of, of a repeat state championship, but are proud Metro and district champions. The big story of the fall season is the Winter Parks High School boys golf team, and Coach Rob Robinson is here tonight with the team to tell you more. Rob. <coughs> What a year. Uh, it's first let me just uh, say thank you for inviting us and, and having this opportunity to be recognized. Uh, I've, I've been coaching Winter Park uh, since 2004-2005 uh, originally as a, as a baseball coach and the last seven, year, seven years as uh, the head golf coach. And this year uh, was extremely special. Uh, and, and I don't want to take a lot of your time. I know we've got a lot to go through, but uh, I just want to say uh, over the years of coaching, I've never had a better team. And, and golf is interesting because it's an individual sport. And yet you come together and you have five players and four of those scores count um, as a team, cumulative team score. And this group uh, has shown such um, aptitude of, of teamwork. Uh, a lot of times the five guys that play get recognized. Uh, but the reality of it is, you see, we have 12 guys here, and it's all 12 that, that played all year long, all season long, that pushed each other to excellence. And I'm honored to have uh, been their coach this year. Uh, last year, we missed the state title by two strokes, and we were motivated uh, to get the job done this year. And, and despite a manure truck um, <laughs> turning over and creating an issue on the first day as, as we had uh, one player just get there in time to go play, no warm up at all. And that was Michael Mays shot even par 72, uh, which is pretty Im impressive. Um, we were two strokes behind, excuse me, three strokes behind going into the final day, and the guys just came together and did it. Uh, we won by five strokes with a score of 603. This is the first state title in boys golf uh, for Winter Park High School. So I'm honored to be their coach. They're a great group of young men, and I love the opportunity to, to just recognize them individually, if you wouldn't mind. Absolutely. Guys, why don't you stand up for a second? <laughs> I like the principal to stand up too. Uh, so first off, we have uh, our principal, Matt Arnold, uh, been tremendous support this year, so thank you very much for that. Uh, in the back, uh, my right-hand man, assistant coach David Roberts. Next to him in the back, sophomore Andrew Clark. In the front row here, closest to me, sophomore William Deswart. Next up, we have sophomore Lowen Chesley. We have sophomore Stephen Hickam. We have senior Colin Dowden. 
Our lone freshman, Ben Walker. <laughs> Junior, Brandon Boncori. <laughs> Junior, Josh Ziplin. <laughs> Sophomore, Griffin Estes. <laughs> Sophomore, Michael Mays. And last but not least, sophomore Jacob Siplin. So again, we're honored to have represented Orange County Public Schools and Winter Park High School, and we're looking forward to going and getting another one next year. Thank you all very much for having great, us. Great today. job, Coach. That. Great job. Before we before we let the, the boys sit down, the gentlemen sit down, we'd like them to come up. I think everybody would like to shake their hands. And I want to commend you for the job you've done with them. And the parents as well, because I know we have the siblings here, but for every one of these kids stands parents and mentors that have supported them. Their humility impressed me enormously. As you introduced each one of them, they clapped for each other, but they put their head down. So um, that humility will carry you far. Bring Thank them you up. very much. Come on up, guys. All right. Yeah, are, the, are there any parents that are here with the, with the, with the young men? Absolutely. Are we allowed to do photos? I'm new here. I don't know what the rules are. <laughs> when it comes, seriously, when it comes to photographing kids, I'm not sure. So I would love to have a photo with you guys again. Thank you. I might have to squish in All right, before we let you all go, I know you all want to go home and get some dinner and school night and everything, but before you leave, we have one other we have one other special We have one other special announcement. Member Gordon, you're going to want to pay attention here. Okay. okay, because it we are one day late in celebrating Superintendent Dr. Jenkins birthday. And our tradition here, our well-established tradition of one meeting, of one, <laughs> is that the vice chair leads us in the singing of happy birthday. <laughs> and we've chosen the vice chair. I have chosen the vice chair. I appointed the vice chair to this honor because I sing really, really bad, and I will never be vice chair. So you will never have to hear me lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So with that, or I'm sorry, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Lead us in happy, you, in happy yeah, birthday. Ask Angie Gallo and all of those that have those beautiful voices. And they'll get their turn. They too will, they too will serve oh, as vice so chair. On three. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Miss Jenkins. Happy birthday to you. Next time we'll have the choirs from the 22 high schools. To go. Oh, there we go. That's
Thank you. That is a great that's idea. A great idea. <laughs> no, that is a great idea. And we that's do, how you get to people do. to sign up for responsibility. Yes. Yes, really you tag good. them, and people it. like Member Gordon comes up with a great idea. I think you're absolutely you right. You did with the with the tradition of the vice chair. Yes, and and you've now delegated that. And I think but that's excellent. They better excellent. watch out for next year, for whoever. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Okay. Happy um, birthday, Member Gallo. <laughs> you're recognized. Thank you, thank you, Member or Madam Chair. Um, it's yeah, they're not easy. Okay. Um, I just want to offer my personal congratulations and just share a quick story. The first time I met, well, the second time I met the principal was at a Winter Park leadership that was held at Winter Park High, and he could not be more proud of you boys. He bragged and bragged and bragged about um, the golf team and what a tremendous job you did. So again, I just want to say congratulations. I'm so very proud of you. Way to go, coaches. Way to go, principal. We're just, we're just thrilled. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have, uh, we are going to call now. You all are free to go if you want to go. And then um, Dr. Jenkins is going to introduce some of our newly appointed administrators. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have three tonight. Our first is Alejandro Brinzo, who was dean at Arbor Ridge K-8, will now be the new assistant principal at Arbor Ridge. Thank you, school board members. Superintendent Barbara Jenkins and staff for the opportunity to serve at Arbor Ridge K-8 School. I'd like to recognize my professional mentors, Vanessa DeMars, Jeff Aldridge, and Kevin Duncan. I'd also like to thank and introduce my family members who are here. With me this evening, Craig Brinzo, my husband, my children, Are those children here with us? One is, the other two are really young, so okay. this is kind of like. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Devin Landon and Victoria, and my mother, Setley Mullins. Finally, thank you to the Arbor Ridge K 8 and Avalon Elementary team members. It surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> and Principal DeMars and Aldridge, who came out to welcome and support me this evening. Next we have Nicole Campbell, acting principal at East River, will be the principal at East River High School. Thank you, school board members, Superintendent Jenkins, and staff for this opportunity to serve at East River High School. I'd like to recognize my professional mentors, Dr. Border, Dr. Barrio, Dr. Bradshaw, Dr. Armbruster, and Dr. Padawano, um, and really many other OCPS members. I'd also like to thank and introduce my family members that are here with me this evening, my loving husband, Joshua Campbell, my mom and dad who are over there, I-4 was a little bit, but Kathy and Mike Moshes. And finally, I'd like to thank the East River team, my members here, and all of my other friends that came out tonight to welcome me. Thank you. Finally, we have Sh Shane Silp, acting assistant principal at Waterford, will be the assistant principal at Cheney Elementary School. Thank you, school board members, Superintendent Jenkins, and the staff for this opportunity to serve at Cheney Elementary. I'd like to recognize my professional mentors, Kathy Peterson, Natalie Stevens, Steve Subesis, who couldn't be here. I'd like to also thank my family members and fiance, who cannot be here tonight but are watching from afar. Finally, thank you to the Cheney Elementary team members and Principal Robin Broner, who came out to welcome me this evening. Thank you. We are delighted to present these new administrators, and I've said to most of their family members, we understand when they take on those roles, it means the entire family become dedicated volunteers for Orange County <laughs> Public Schools. So thank you for the sacrifice of their time that you provide for us as well. Congratulations to each of you. Thank you, and congratulations on behalf of the board. We're very proud of the work that you've done to get to this point, and we're very grateful for your dedication to our children. Okay, Dr. Jenkins, uh, you all also are welcome to leave if you want to join your, your family. I definitely wanted to hold you hostage until we'd had the, <laughs> the singing of the happy birthday. <laughs> Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Dr. Jenkins, are there any changes to the agenda? There is one change, Madam Chair. That is item 1502, request approval of Second Amendment to show Alter Field facility use agreement is being withdrawn until a later time. All right, thank you. The Chair finds cause to amend the agenda as requested. Is there a motion to amend the agenda? So moved. Motion by Member Gould. Is there a second? Second. Second by Member Castor Dental. I'm sorry, Member Bird. All in favor, please say aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Before we take action on the amended agenda, we have several speakers who have indicated a desire to address the board regarding an item or items on the consent agenda. Um, you'll have three minutes if you're speaking to end items on the consent agenda. If you could please give your name and address for the record. Um, Mr. Rodriguez, I, do we have? I say we have. We don't. I'm sorry. We have no members. Wonderful. Then is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? Move the approval. A uh, uh, motion by Member Gordon. Is there a second? Second, second by Member Castor Dental. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now we'll move on to the non consent agenda. And we will hear from Dr. Jenkins regarding item 1701 approval of the school board of Orange County to select the name of the school for 208 K8 SE3. You're recognized. Dr. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a little contingency back there waiting for this oh, good. item. <laughs> <laughs> on the agenda. That's why the room didn't clear out just okay. yet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> ah, yes, I see them. John Wright is our area superintendent. He's going to bring us the information, this resolution, and uh, then we will give it back to the board for a decision. Good evening, Madam Chair Jacobs, distinguished board members, and Superintendent Jenkins. Tonight, on behalf of the stakeholders of um, current school 208 K8 SE3, um, it's my privilege to present their input to you regarding the naming of their new school. The Pershing Pine Castle School Advisory Council began surveying stakeholders on October 1st of 2018 when a Google survey went live to the community, students and staff. This form allowed stakeholders to give suggestions for the new name along with the rationale for each suggestion. The survey window closed on October 13th and the SAC members reviewed all the suggestions at their October 18th meeting. And they narrowed the list down to six possible choices. At that time, the SAC sent a Google survey to stakeholders via OCPS email, PTA email, and social media. Paper copies of the survey were also available and sent home with students. The survey window remained open through November 7th of 2018. The SAC received 290 responses and compiled the results. And then they voted to forward the top three responses for your consideration this evening. The top three responses were Pershing School, Pershing Avenue School, and Fort Gatlin School. All names are consistent with our past practice of simply referring to K-8 schools that are not magnet schools as school without reference to the grade level served. Pershing School represents the name of the elementary that was previously on the site of the new school. Pershing Avenue represents the name of the previous elementary along with the street address for the new school site. And then Fort Gatlin highlights the historical significance as Fort, there was a Fort, Fort Gatlin that was commissioned by Zachary Taylor and it was built at the beginning of the Second Seminole War that was also located near the site of the current school. Tonight, Principal Jaster is here, as you see many of the stakeholders that have been instrumental in this process of bringing you these options. Several teachers and parents are here. And so with that, we look forward to your decision, and um, thanks for your consideration. Absolutely. Um, let me recognize Member Covert. The school is in her district. Can you tell us the percentage of votes for the three school names, please? Um, yes, ma'am. Um, Pershing School received 53% of the 290 votes. Pershing Avenue School received 18%. Uh, and then um, Fort Gatlin received 11%. And the other 12% or so were divided among the other three choices. Thank you. So that's very important because it is in our tradition to really listen to the community in the naming of a school. And as a personal point of privilege, I just have to tell you how important this is to me. Um, when I was very first elected, I came in front of this community 
and said, if I do nothing else, we will get this K-8 school built. And we are almost there. So tonight is just so important to me, and I could not be more proud of this community. You see the sea of blue back here. Um, you have parents, you have teachers, you have principals, you have neighbors um, who are all here tonight to witness that, witness this. So with that, uh, I would like to recommend that we name our <clears throat> school currently known as 208K8SE3, a much more desirable name uh, <laughs> to be known as Pershing School. And that is my recommendation, and I would like to move that we name the school Pershing School. Motion by Member Cobert. Is there a second? S second by Member Gallo. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Congratulations. Congratulations. So I just want to know, do you have other signs up there? Had this turned out? <laughs> oh, she has two in the back. That's precious. <laughs> Always have a backup plan, right? I remember if, if my kids learned one thing above all else through their years in Orange County Public Schools, always have a plan B and maybe a plan C. So I see that we have somebody in the back with plan B and C. Wonderful. Thank you. Great job. All right. We're very excited. We're very excited to have this new school. Before um, uh, Dr. Jenkins, we went through, I'm sorry, we went through consent agenda. Um, we are now on items 1801 and 1802, and um, Dr. Jenkins, we'll hear from you at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. I um, have four things to share with you briefly, and as we've been hosting those individual meetings with board members, we'll get more and more detail available to you. Let me mention uh, one item that is probably on everyone's mind regarding the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas um, report that was released want to remind uh, both board members and the general public that we do not discuss school safety issues beyond um, a very high level report uh, outside of executive session. That is an added measure for the safety of our children and staff. So on February 5th is when we are planning to have an executive session where we can talk more about some additional uh, provisions, plans that we've made after the release of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas report. Uh, wanted to make you aware of that and general public as well that we are quite aware and making plans for that. Secondly, I wanted to mention our HR department under uh, Dr. Bridget Williams quite capably uh, is looking toward having a new hotline for our staff. We wanted to have it released this week. We will certainly have it in the next few days as all of the logistics are set up, but it's called an employee digital hotline. It's a provision we are making for teachers, employees, any staff members that might have questions. Uh, uh, they've heard a rumor, they had a question, they couldn't quite get the answer they wanted uh, from their principal or their FAC or their supervisor, we will have an employee digital hotline. They can ask questions about Florida statutes, about district policies and clarifications, about our management directives, any kind of general workplace uh, questions they might have or any questions around one of the two contracts that we negotiate. All of those will be uh, openly available Brief digital mailbox means someone can submit a question and get an answer back within a day if they have uh, a concern. And so we're very excited about that. It is a service to our employees uh, from our HR department. And so it will be launching. You'll hear more about it. It will be launching toward the end of this week. Very pleased about that. Thirdly, we have been talking about the renovation of our strategic plan and ready to start those meetings. The very first one will be on January 29th. Not to worry, we've been holding these dates on your calendars. January 29th will be our very first meeting where we start to discuss our vision, mission, and goals and how we might go about renovating or adjusting them uh, as we see fit. Have a consultant that will be working with us to that end. And then we've also been talking in my individual meetings regarding our calendar. If you recall, the first calendar was uh, quite foreboding. Uh, it, it, 
formidable, I should say. It had quite a few things that we wanted to cram into a year. I will tell you, unless we met several times a week, we could not get them in in actual work sessions. So what I'm talking with individual board members about are around their priorities. Some of those items Chairman and I, uh, Chair and I have been speaking about will be through individual meetings, through school board updates once a month at one of our board meetings, uh, and through through our uh, board updates that are published for you as well. And then we will have some that are actual work sessions. We've culled the number down. What I promised you was that we would try to have on alternate, alternate weeks when we're not having a board meeting, either a Tuesday or a Thursday, not Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, to wear you down. We're going to have, and we think that calendar is close to being manageable. We'll be sharing that with you shortly. Lastly, when this meeting is over, we will have to actually clear the room for uh, time that we have that is confidential. It is to prepare for our own safety preparations here in the boardroom. My staff has been trained previously. Board members were trained previously. Since we have five new individuals, you need to be prepared for what our safety protocols are for this actual room as well. And so at the close of the meeting, don't go anywhere. Uh, our safety and security staff, our police uh, department will help walk us through our protocols for regulations here in this building. Madam Chair, members of the board, that's all. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Mr. Rodriguez, General Counsel. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, board members, there's no report other than we will have a, an, a, um, an ethics training uh, next week on the 17th. And uh, I am asking that if you can attend, obviously not only is that just a workshop, but it's an opportunity to get your ethics credits that you'll need for the 2019 year out of the way, as well as discussing the local uh, ethics policy that we have, which is comprehensive, and some of the other aspects about public records, forms, et cetera. So an exciting session on ethic coming your way next week. So I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Under uh, school board committee reports, do we have any reports? Go ahead, Member Gould. We, we, did, have, oh. we did have a communications um, committee meeting prior to the break, and uh, I may have shared those, but the minute should be out on board docs, and we really talked about the schedule and the tools that were available um, to the board members for communicating with constituents as well as messaging. Absolutely. Any other committee reports? Member Gallo. We also held a legislative committee um, in December to discuss our legislative priorities. Um, we discussed the appointment of the new education commissioner up in um, Tallahassee of uh, Speaker Corcoran, and I believe that those should be as available as well as those minutes should be available. And our priorities, we should be able to find on the website as well if anybody would like to review what our, our um, state priorities and our federal priorities are for OCPS. Wonderful. Thank you for that update. Are there any other members that would like to agenda any policy level issues for future discussion, board discussion, or work session? Member Castro-Dennel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up some issues that we did not bring up on the last meeting but have been brought to my attention before then and since then, and I don't think it's going away, um, and that is the issue of high school start times. And um, I know that the previous board has done a lot of uh, research into um, what it would take to change the schedules, and it is a, it's a very big uh, undertaking. But I think with the, the successful student outcomes that have, we've seen at Seattle um, and that Hillsborough County has been able to push their times back and make it work and they're a comparable sized district here in Florida and given the uh, reports or recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics and all this overwhelming support for the importance of sleep and teenagers I think it's um, I think it would uh, be a good idea to kind of look into that for the upcoming school year in August and and look at some of the options. I know that some of the options that we looked at or the former board looked at um, didn't always entertain moving the high school start times back um, to 830, which is what's been recommended by 
various groups. Um, so if we could look at that as a starting point and then try to look at all the other variables, I think that would be a worthwhile work session. Okay. Um, one of the things, Member Kester Dental, that I've asked for because I understand there were costs associated with um, transportation, but then I understood there might be some other costs that weren't initially, I think, contemplated in the survey having to do um, with negotiated um, the salary uh, component of, of that. I personally don't understand that issue well enough and had asked the superintendent um, and her staff if they could get me educated and more informed so that so that I could, the article that um, you read, that you probably read, didn't completely communicate my position on this. I really want to understand why the school board in the past had not embraced that idea, and I assume that there were some compelling reasons because I know that it's been discussed time and time again. So I wanted to get up to speed with what the concerns were um, and then look at are there any other options that haven't been considered that another way that we could get there. So um, that's my thoughts on this. I'd love to hear from other board members on this. I do, I do think. I. I had four kids who all went to school with these early start times, and I remember vividly what that was like as they staggered out of the door in the morning, half awake. Um, and I do think that without a scientific study, I, as a mom, believed my kids would have been better served by starting later. Having said that, this, this board, the previous board, have spent a lot of time on it, so I've got, I've got some catching up to do. Other um, members, either uh, current board members or new board members, I'm sorry, yes, um, Member Bird. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I totally agree with you. I think that as a new board that there's, you know, that we would like to be updated on what the process was before and what we learned and um, we'd like to be more educated on the issue as well. I think I personally agree with you as a parent. Um, I have a high schooler now, so I get it. Um, but also, as an educator, I know probably Joanna could agree that <laughs> that first period, um, when I've subbed in those first period classes, yeah, it can in high school it can be pretty brutal. Um, the tardies, and I know we've, I think we've studied that as well. But um, I know when I've subbed, I've had a lot of tardies and a lot of kids that weren't quite alert. So um, it's definitely an issue that I think that we should look at, and one that our new board we should be. Um, educated a little more about. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Member Gallo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, um, I agree. I, I saw the, I read through the survey results um, with the different start times, and I, I understand there are some contract issues. I've been told there's contract issues, and there's some cost issues associated with it, but I would like to be educated, and I think it's something worth pursuing because it is detrimental to our high school children. And we're, we've been learning a lot about chronic absenteeism and the effects on learning, whether that's from teachers or students. And so I think with some new information that I've just gathered that I would, I would like to do a deeper dive and, and figure out what's going on and understand better what, what our hesitation or what our barriers are. Okay, Member Gould. I was just going to um, suggest that everybody uh, take a look at the survey and, and that went out previously. And um, also, I'll speak for myself and I think for the last board, no one was opposed to having new school start times. But when we started to outline the pros and the cons, and kind of the domino effect that it had, not only the financial, but on um, work times, on uh, children, older children who were staying, you know, home for, um, and able to be home for younger children, that it, it started to have a lot of ripple effect. And it was more than, it's not a one dimensional topic by any stretch of the means. So I think if everybody could get that baseline of really understanding that survey and, and if you say, um, 
do you want to change high school start times? The answer is always yes. But when you say, do you want to change high school start times if it costs $30 million and your kids can't be home when your um, elementary school or middle schooler is, or they can't have a job, or we have to move athletics to 5 a.m., or all of the sudden the yes has become, well, I'm not sure. Or no, because then I have to get child care or I have to, I don't have a transportation mechanism. So it, it's not as, I wish it was as simple in black and white because it would have made it so much easier the, the last time that this was discussed. Um, but I think that survey really is that, that um, good document to gather some of that data because that initial question is, do you want this? Well, yes. But then when you say, if this and this and this change, do you want it? Some of the responses changed. So that's, that's really that piece. Then I think we could have a more robust conversation about it. And, and I was just re-looking at the survey. And I, I don't, um, that was almost 30,000 people that took that survey before. And it included teachers and students and parents and community members. And we went out to the business community as well. Um, so I think it was a good sample of our community at that time. Member Colbert. Thank you. Member Gould, I think you laid it out very well having, having been here. Um, the question that I always got back because I was, I was always, I will publicly say a proponent of later start times mm -hmm. and many of the board members were. But as Member Gould laid out, it's not that simple, and it is not just financial. I was a parent when the school board did the flip, flipping of middle school and high school start times. For us, it wasn't a problem, but for many families, it was a problem. As Mrs. Gould said, um, extracurricular activities, school uh, sports practices and all, many of them got moved to the morning, so kids were still going at the same time. For historical reference, there were at least two, if not three, school board members who were elected on returning the start times back to the earlier time. So that's just for historical reference. So the point that I'm trying to make is simply that it is complicated. The research is there. I would like to see it happen. But I think we also need a fiscal strategy. We had talked about in our legislative committee meeting about some of the things we would like to ask for from the legislature, and one of those things needs to be funding for transportation. We're funded at less than 50%. If we were fully funded, that might help us to get there. So as we work through this conversation, I think we need to have a strategic component as well. Thank you, and I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that was part of what, what I'm saying I need to understand. I've watched the meeting. I do need to understand the financial part, but I've also, for the handful of people who have contacted me, have urged them to if we can't find a way to do it with, with the resources we have, then they should help us advocate for the state funding that we need to make that a reality. And I'm pleased to say, again, it's not many, it's two people I think that contacted me, but two are all in. <sighs> Member Gordon. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I love what I'm hearing because uh, each of you bring and expertise to this board, and I think it would help us uh, tremendously. Um, as previous board members who went through this and those who were teaching at the time and in the school system uh, during the time of the flip, it, it, um, we lost uh, quite a bit of, a, uh, we lost some great employees um, during the flip because of, um, it, it was a lot. They, they shared with us, and some didn't want to listen, so they just said, "Well, I'm going to go elsewhere," and and I and I hate I would hate to see anything like that happen again. So what I'm I'm going to um, just ask here, if we could get the chairman and the superintendent to get together um, for us, because Dr. Jenkins, I know that you and um, our chair, lady, you here concerns and I think it's going to always come up but do we want that our priority 
knowing what the other boards went through, knowing the struggle that this district went through, knowing what the community went through, knowing what the teaching force went through, I'm in a K-12 school for the last 25 years in Osceola County, and I have kindergartens up until high school. I can tell you what's that like with those babies walking in there. And, and each of us have over 30 schools in our district, and I know that we are aware of what goes on there. And before sometime um, we move and, and, and do a lot of things, we need to take the whole thing into um, consideration. So what I was going to ask, if, if the chair and the superintendent would do, I know what I'm looking at is the time staff was consumed in trying to meet with each of us individually. There are now eight of us. I think when we started was seven. It's a lot for the staff to try to get together to talk with each of us to address every concern. So we get general counsel and um, Deborah McGill and board service and um, the superintendent department to, um, you know, we do it as an open forum and maybe public input also, open discussion, and because we've done that too, allow the public a, a time to weigh in. But I think before we do that, is this a priority? And we may need to do this in a board retreat. When hearing all the good things, we need to find out what our good things are and what are the things that we can accomplish and what we can accomplish within a four-year period or even in a two-year period because we don't know with um, two of our members having a two-year period and going to have to get out and run again. And then some of us are coming up with the end of the four years and it's going to have to run again so you don't want to get out too far on a limb and can't accomplish anything so dr jenkins if we could task you in the chair some kind of way that you could get together and bring us back your data on what actually took place and get, give us the pros and cons of what we would be up against as a board, I think this would give us more vision because everybody has what they, their take is, but only pretty much three of us or four of us up here, two as parents or educators, uh, actually went through that, went through what it actually took. People saw it from the inside and they saw it from the outside, but they really don't know. So Dr. Jenkins and to the chair, I'm gonna put it back on the chair, Madam uh, Superintendent, to see if you all could come together and give us some type of retreat to deal with our priorities and making this <coughs> one of the priorities to see if we wanna do it as a group. Open discussion, hearing the pros and cons and say, okay, maybe this is something we want to take to task, and maybe this is something we do not want to take to task. So, Madam Chair, I'll put it back with you and the um, superintendent to see where you go from here. Thank you, um, Vice Chair. Let me, um, let me mention, I think you hit on, is this, where does this rank in terms of priorities yes. in terms of how much time we allocate? And I think you also hit on the one thing that I feel like I need to understand in order to decide if it's a priority, and that is what is the give <coughs> and take. So I think your point about Dr. Jenkins and I trying to consolidate this down to something very succinct that communicates what are, what are the implications mm -hmm. and reviewing what those implications are, bringing that back Bring to the board, back because the you whole can't whole decide if it's a priority until you understand the implications. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so uh, we'll work on, Thank we'll you. work together on figuring out the most best use of the board and the staff's time in bringing something concise back that we can get our hands around. Um, with that, we have Ms. Gallo. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I agree. I agree with, with everything that you just said. I would, I would like to include, because I do agree that in order for us to make an educated decision on if it should be a priority, we need it, all the facts. So if we can include in that the information on how Hillsborough County, which is a rather large urban district, is able to move their start times and do it efficiently and effectively, um, I think that that would be useful information for us to use as we move forward. So excellent, like excellent point. Um, Member Kester Dennell. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I didn't mean to open a big can of worms, but I guess um, I'm I, actually I did. I, I didn't hesitate, really. Thank you. <laughs> 
I know. Um, I would just like to volunteer to um, work in a committee, uh, a board committee, to pull information together, hearing what everyone has said and information from the past and information that's out there now. I'm happy to lend my energy and not have to overburden staff if that helps. Um, okay, let's hear from um, Member Lo Lopez. Do, Member Lopez, and then we'll come back to Member Gordon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, with this topic, I agree with um, with Chair um, Pam and Kat and the rest of the um, school board members because I believe that there is a lot of aspects that we take in, that we have to take in consideration. I remember when I used to be a teacher at Colonial High School and being a coach, it was very detrimental for our students um, to practice sports after 4 p.m. in high school. Um, even it was uh, a challenge to keep them motivated um, during school time during the last two periods. So I believe that we need data. We need data to compare and not data. And it's helpful to have data from other counties, but we need data from here, from Orange County Public Schools. Because sometimes we have something that works in other counties and we believe that it's gonna work here, but we are different. Central Florida is different. So I believe that we have to do our research here in Central Florida. Of course, it's always helpful to have um, information and research from other um, counties and states, but I think that we are different. If I have something that works, a, a service or any initiative that works maybe in Timber Creek, that doesn't mean that it's gonna work at Lenona High School because we are different, we are diverse, and we have to take that in consideration as well. Um, Member Gordon. Yes, I love that, Member Lopez. That's that's great. I, lo I love what we are saying, but let's, I'm, I'm trying to get us to, um, and I know the chairman is, and she spoke well in reference to it, going off into committees, because when you begin to go up to committees for a topic that large, there aren't but F eight of us. And when I came on the board, and I'm just saying, when I came on board, um, in 2000, we, we did everything. Uh, the committees came along when everybody could not be scheduled. And uh, Mrs. McGill was having a very difficult time scheduling because everybody had different jobs and they had different activities that they wanted to do. But when you prioritize something, you want to prioritize before you break it up because that way you're not allowing those that cannot be there to be there because all of us up here, we, everyone including the chairman, except the superintendent and general counsel are part-time. So let me put that to you. We're all part-time, we've been elected to serve, but we pretty much put in full-time. We need to kind of be cohesive because right now when you go off into this committee, you're gonna come back and just tell us what you all are gonna do and we're either gonna like it or not. It'll be so great with something of this topic and I thank uh, member Daniel uh, for really wanting to go off and get a committee on it, but I think it negates my part that I ask if the chair and the superintendent would see if that is even warranted because the superintendent and the chair can gather data. We have the Council of Great City Schools. We have the top 10 districts in Florida always working together. One of my biggest struggles, all of our biggest struggle on this board is when we all had to fight the governor of the state of Florida and come together and form the coalition. That's how Rick Roach came up with the coalition. But it interfered with the larger districts. The larger districts, as Joanna is saying, is totally different from any other district that you look at. And the Council of Great City Schools and the National School Board, so all of this would help us gather data. Dr. Jenkins has Inwood into this. Her, her, her team has Inwood into it that would bring us back organization. I just don't wanna see us split and go off with this committee, then you split and go off with that 
uh, the chairman already have committees and others can be formed as we go along the way. But those major committees, if this becomes a major priority, you would want everybody at the table, I would hope. But before we even get at the table, my suggestion was, and I don't know if you want to negate my suggestion, but mine was to let the superintendent, and it was well said by Chairman Jacobs that she and the superintendent would get together. We don't want to pull staff. The committee will be pulling staff into the west, to the east, the north, and some of us are going to get upset and say, well, if you got this group over there, I want to know what's going on. And then you're going to begin to pull on staff time. And I did hear um, several of my learned colleagues on the end of the table, on the north side of the table, stating that... Um, they didn't want to really do that. So what I'm asking, it, would you not mind if the chairman and the um, superintendent, and I'm going to address in the chairman so she can identify who speaks, but if the superintendent and the chairman could at least find out when we do a board retreat, we have not had. You don't know it. We don't know everybody's priority. We don't know if it's going to gel with everybody. And we work from that based on what we come up with, with the strategic plan. So we got a major, y'all don't know that strategic plan is something. So when you begin to dilly-dally yourself off, you're going to be stuck here till 2, 3 in the morning. And we've done that. Okay. So it, just if we could just kind of work together and see what happens with your proposal that you presented and see where the superintendent would come in. They may bring data in from the largest Florida school districts and the Council of Great City Schools, not only from around, those are the largest, those are 72 counties, 72 school districts in the nation. They have the data, they have it. So um, Madam Chair, and I'm asking, um, uh, you know, yeah. Member Daniel, if she would allow us to work through you all on just this 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 portion, which is your dream, with the start time. Uh, okay. So okay. before I could call on Member Kester Daniel, I, I think if if I can interject for a second, because I, I've I have not served on as many boards I, th I think as you have, Member Gordon. It, we're probably pretty close, but you've been on this board and you lived through the the switching of the times, the switching back. I have enormous respect for your experience on this board. I've, and I think you've had the same experience I've had where I've worked on, I've served on some boards that worked well together and I've served on some boards that didn't. And I think that one of the keys to a board that works well together is when all voices mm -hmm. are honestly heard. And, and I appreciate very much you working very hard because I also know what it's like to be on a board for a while and when new people come on, you know, everybody's got fresh ideas, and and those who have been on a board for a while generally know we've tried that six different times, and that's why we're not there. So I, I appreciate the frustration of the existing board members who have been through this and know what we don't know and know why why we are where we are. But what I heard Member Caster Dennell asking to be a part of wasn't a committee that makes recommendations, but a fact-finding committee. What I heard Caster Dennell, Member Caster Dennell talk about was she would like to be able to provide information and research into that. I know I hear you saying that that's staff, but I also heard Member Gallo rep saying, I want to know what Hillsboro is doing. And what I find works best for a board is the questions and the information that we have, if we know that we can provide that information and that, that all of that information is being considered, then the outcome of a work session we have confidence in because we know that all the research that we were concerned about, everything that we did, is a part of this, what is presented to the board. I think that's key to us building trust, that each of us knows that every ounce of information that we think is critical for decision making is at the table. That's what I heard Kester Dennell asking for, not the opportunity to have three or four of us that, that make a recommendation that kind of s stonewall the rest of the board, but rather that there's an opportunity if she's gathered information or knows of resources, that that's a part of the information at the table. I think that's really important, whether that's done through a committee or whether that's done through emails or board members providing information. But I think every decision we need to make, each one of you needs to be able to bring everything you know to the table, whether it's something that 
each, that each of us is going to like or not like. You need to be able to put it on the table, and it needs to be part of our decision making. The best experiences I've had serving on a board has been when diverse people from diverse backgrounds feel free to bring stuff to the table. And I tell you sincerely, there are so many times I have walked into a, a commission meeting as the mayor thinking I knew how I was going to vote, and after I heard my colleagues changed my mind, or after I heard the public, I changed my mind because I had a richer, fuller understanding. And that's the value of whether it's a committee process or whether there's another way. But if, if Member Castor Dental and Member Gallo and each of us isn't allowed and encouraged to present the information that may challenge the way we've done things in the past, then we, we, there won't be the buy-in and there won't be the kind of reciprocal trust that we need to have for us to accomplish our goals as a team. So with that, Member Kester Dental, I'll turn to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think you, you pretty much summarized better than I could um, my thoughts. <laughs> so thank you. And um, Member Gordon, I did not mean to um, overstep or, or try to take on any responsibility that was not um, appropriate. Uh, my efforts were to help the process uh, along and not overburden staff with um, information that, I, that is readily available. Okay. Um, let's we're, we'll, we'll hear from Member Gordon, and then we're going to hear from Dr. Jenkins with some, well, I'm sure, some divine wisdom. Okay, I think it went a little, uh, we went way out. I think we need to set our priorities, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm going to ask that we at least have a board retreat, and let's set our priorities. And everybody could bring whatever they want. I think I encouraged on the last meeting, I don't want you to ever think any of us are sitting up here blocking you because you will carry on. We're not, we don't plan to stay, okay? I'm just being honest with you. So you're either going to be carrying on with a multiplicity of knowledge and techniques or you're just going to carry on. I suggest, and I'm asking before we go off carrying on, that we have a board retreat. I asked that in the very beginning of asking that the chair and the superintendent sit down, hearing everybody. I think I encouraged the um, bringing up of the concern without getting any type of consensus or voting on it or seeing if anybody else feel the same. I can voice my opinion, but I don't have to ask, but how do you feel? You could do that, but, and you could do it because open sunshine law, but why? When we have not met behind the scenes, and we have not, I feel like Nancy Pelosi now, you know, we, this should be discussed in a session that we come out together, we know what we're doing, we're not continuing to come to every board meeting and just throw out ideas, but we, have, we know our ideas, we prioritize our ideas, and we go forward and work forward to see how we can task the superintendent to make some of those ideas happen. That's board governance. We, I'm, I'm just a, a stickler about board governance and where we're going, that's it. And I think the, uh, all of the ideas are good. I'm an encourager for everybody, Melissa, to get hers out. Everybody, Pam, Linda, Joanna, all of us, and you've got to get your ideas out. Every single one of us, why do you think we are where we are today? Because we got them out, but we had an order to get them out, okay? And all I ask is that we task the superintendent, the chairman has the authority. She could sit with her. We could have our retreat. We could rank order and do what we need to do. Okay? That's what I'm just saying. Okay. Member Gordon, I, I'm sorry, but each time you, you raise the issue of me asking other board members no, for no, consensus, I want to clarify what well, you just brought it back up, no, ma'am. You just brought it back up. Okay. The it's on the tape. So I want to clarify. 
when I did this at the last meeting and uh, a member raised an issue, if there's only one member who's concerned about an issue, there would be very little point in the superintendent allocating a lot of step time to that issue. So it was important to me to understand if one person raises an issue, is there, are there other members that share that concern? So it's not about taking a vote, it's about researching and whether or not it rises to the level of requiring some research. This issue, several of us have said it, it is hard for me to tell you what priority level it rises to without better understanding what are the costs. I was told they were a couple of million, that's what was sent out in the survey. Then I was told they were closer to possibly tens of millions. The difference between that makes a big difference in whether I would call it a priority or not. So I can't, it would be pointless to have a retreat and then discuss it, I would need more information. That's what I said when I started, that's where I stand. I need more information. If I'm the only person who needs information, then I'll get my information one-on-one. -on -one. If it's two of us, we'll get information one-on-one. -on -one. I heard a number of people who wanted information. At this point, it may make more sense for us to come back as a board and get that information together. But I'm pleased to take your advice and spend time with Dr. Jenkins. Um, and look over that information and bring back the most succinct report that we can to the board in a workshop. But I also want any member of this board who thinks there's something we may overlook to please bring that information forward, whether that is directly to Dr. Jenkins or whether we have to form a subcommittee formed for the purpose of fact finding. We'll do one or the other. I'll wait for some feedback from you all, but if you're comfortable providing the information you have, I do not want to come back and have a work session and find out that any members have issues and information that wasn't put on the table because that robs all of us the opportunity of making the best decisions. With that, let me recognize Superintendent Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Certainly informed from the board's discussion in your wisdom, I think uh, there are is a potential solution if we are to condense and consolidate and bring back a more succinct report for board members then I would offer any board member who has research or information they have gathered if you would just get it to my chief of staff Bridget Williams we will make sure that is included in the consolidation excellent thank you all right any further um, business to come before the board member Lopez Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to know if we can have uh, a biliteracy um, week. Um, maybe it will be a great idea because we already have uh, a biliteracy steel diploma in Orange County Public Schools and we speak more than 100 languages in our county and it will be validate our diversity in our county. So I think that it will be a great idea if we have that. I love the idea. I don't exactly know what you envision, but I want to hear more about it. Um, the superintendent. Thank you, Madam Chair. So in, in our agenda today, we recognize Literacy Week. Uh -huh. And so this notion of also celebrating all of our students who speak more than one language, uh, I think we could make a significant celebration over that. There was a time, and I, and I want to be very clear, the majority of our students that are biliterate speak Spanish, but we have over 160 different languages. And so students can earn a biliteracy seal on their high school diploma, as oh, wow. Member Lopez mentioned. They can earn that seal if they, and it's not just, just that you speak, you have to be able to write in that language as well and have passed certain courses, but they can earn that biliteracy seal. I would love to, and, and I, I I guess I'll, I'll task staff with helping us figure out sometime around when we recognize Literacy Week, then why not also uh, have a recognition for students, not just at their graduation, because they get that seal on their diploma. We did that last year. But why not have a time that we celebrate and recognize students who have earned, who have achieved uh, by literacy? I, I love it. I like that idea. And, and, and focusing on what happens is it gives us another opportunity, board members, to focus on how diverse our community is. People are floored. Anytime we say our children come from 200 different countries and they speak 160 different languages and dialects, people are shocked by that. So if there are other opportunities 
for us to celebrate and recognize those children who are biliterate, I, I would love to do that. I, I, I appreciate that, yeah. that suggestion. And without polling the board, I can tell you, as you probably noticed, every single head on this board is nodding. So great idea, great idea. I did not know about the literacy um, seal. That is awesome. Boy, it, there's, this is a time when that is such great credentials for job finding. So, whew. All right, uh, Member Bird. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a topic to bring up that's totally not related <laughs> at all, but um, I was just wondering if the board has ever, if a previous board has ever discussed um, televising our public comment period of our meetings. Um, I just feel like, you know, as a member of the community, when I've been at home watching our YouTube videos, um, when the board re references a comment that was made in public comment and you have no idea what that public comment was, the whole discussion at the board table makes no sense. So, and I know this happened last time, I had a couple people come to me um, when we were talking about the solar energy um, that Deidre McNabb talked about in public comment before the meeting. It wasn't televised, so then when we referenced it during the meeting, they had no idea what we were talking about. So um, I would just like for us to, you know, throw that idea out there, maybe talk about it. See, I don't know if anyone else thinks that it's something that you know we might wanna do, but um, I think in an effort to be as transparent as we can, I think it would be a great idea. But. Member Gould. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I would actually like to entertain that as well. That is something that we had discussed in the past and um, and probably Member Gordon could talk about some of the, the <laughs> good and the challenges and and things. but there were there were there were some challenges, but I think with our format now, this is when we were um, we had pre-agenda in another room. I think with our format and how we have the timekeeper um, and things that w we, we have a much more fair way of people being able to come in and if multiple people come with multiple topics that they would get a chance to be heard. Whereas e even in our old format sometimes we would run out of time and people would have come um, and they had to come again the next week because they never got a chance in our time frame to get heard. So now that we're in here, have this format, I think it, it may be a little bit more um, fair for the general public because that, that sometimes can happen when you put television cameras on people. They like to, to have that spotlight and <coughs> prevent other people from getting the spotlight who may have an opinion or a concern that they want to air and then they run out of time. So that said, with our, with our current format, I think um, we may be able to manage it and I would for one be willing to try that because it's always something that I've also wanted since I was elected. Any other comments? Member Gallo. No, I did not put my <laughs> Okay, it's working out. Um, I agree, I agree with um, Member Beard and um, Bird and um, Member Gould on what's being said. I, I, and maybe just for the point of clarification, I'm not real sure why, I understand that the, it, it, the setup was differently, why we haven't in the past videotaped or shown live um, the comment section and if there's a change in policy that needs to happen I really don't understand what needs to take place for us to make that change but I'm interested in learning about it. Okay, Member Kester Dental. Uh, I agree with Member Bird and the others. Um, I, um, when I'm watching from home, and I won't be able to do that anymore, but when I'm watching the videos and then I have to go to the audio for the public comment, um, I just often wondered what was keeping us from seeing the people <coughs> speaking. And um, if, it, if it ends up uh, giving people a platform to be seen and to showboat, um, we have, I think, processes in place here 
now, as the other members mentioned. Um, but that's the public, and the public gets to comment at the school board meetings. So I, I would fully support um, the video aspect of that as well. Okay, um, let me uh, let me ask one question to the superintendent. I, uh, as you all know, in Orange County, I went to great lengths to amend the charter um, to provide for public comment. Um, I wasn't able to get this topic even discussed at a board meeting to consider a vote um, of whether that we would propose that for the charter. So, the idea of hearing from the public is extremely important to me. Um, the one uh, reason that I, I don't know the reason why these aren't televised, but I assumed that the reason was probably due to concerns about some of the content and some of the uh, comments and accusations that I've heard over the last um, eight years as county mayor that it often, I often found myself um, trying to, during the meeting, while people are talking, literally trying to find out if what they were saying were, were true or not. And um, accusations uh, that were being made that, quite frankly, more often than not, when I was trying to run them down, were not true. Um, but you have created a forum and people are putting things out onto the airways and you've created and you're using public funds to allow people to put things out in the airways that are not accurate so i thought that and but we continued to do that um but and it was and oftentimes by the time we were able to put correct information out the audience that was probably watching at that time was no longer watching so i assumed that the reason for this was because we Unlike county government, what we deal with here is a whole, no disrespect to county government, a whole lot more precious. We're dealing with our children, we're dealing with teachers, we're dealing with their reputations, and sensitive information that we would not want somebody to be able to misrepresent in any situation. So I thought it was a precautionary um, measure that that information is available, it is tape recorded, every member of the public that wants to get to it can listen to it, but they don't have immediate access to it. It gives us as an organization an opportunity to make sure that things do not make it to the airways that are, are, not, are not correct or shouldn't be shared with the public. That's what I assumed, but I have never had, I have never asked that question. I just assumed that it was in the abundance of caution. Superintendent Jenkins, maybe you could shed some light. Your assumption uh, is correct, Madam Chair. Um, and. Uh, uh, there have been instances where uh, an employee, a teacher, a principal, someone has been maligned, uh, and we would prefer that not go out over the airways. Uh, additionally, we don't have to have any advance notice for a speaker, so if a parent comes and desires to say something like that, it is supposed to be public testimony, and so there's not a debate. There's not an opportunity to go call the principal, call the teacher, call someone to come back and refute it. And so the previous board preferred, because we weren't going to engage and debate and rebut, but take public testimony, uh, the previous board felt that it was appropriate not to make that a televised forum where you cannot refute uh, what might be spoken. Now, is every uh, public speaker going to say something um, that may not be true? I can't tell you that. Have we had speakers that said things that were inappropriate about a teacher, a principal, an employee? Yes, we have. Um, but I, th the previous board was very comfortable that it was recorded and available as opposed to televised. I know, I know we've had some individuals who would like their comments to be televised, and sometimes they are not accurate. And so it creates a forum for someone to come and have a platform in some instances to say things that might not be um, exactly accurate. Th we are certainly, uh, within your policy, you have an ability to change your process. If you desire, I think you would want to 
to consider how will you refute or correct or stop, if you will, Madam Chair, um, previous chairman uh, certainly had to deal with stopping some individuals speaking if they were going down that pathway. But if it's televised, I think you just have to consider with your deliberation how you would try to correct something inappropriate that is aired. Thank you. Member Colbert. So superintendent has stated some of the things that I was going to give you. Again, back to a historical perspective. I fought very hard for public comment. Um, there were many seasoned board members that were not comfortable with it, but I felt very strongly that the public should be able to come and address their elected officials on anything they want to address us. But that was the idea, to give the public easy access to come and address this body. That is the concern about creating a forum where it's televised. Perhaps you're not going to address the body. You want something to go out uh, publicly. There are many people who come and videotape when we do have public comment, and they, they do disperse that out there. I, I th do think, I think the previous board erred on the side of caution to protect our employees, to protect children. So it wasn't about a lack of transparency. We wanted to make it very easy for anyone to come and address us about anything they wanted to talk about, bring to our attention. But that was the forum. And I think it was about erring on the side of caution, protecting those children, protecting um, our teachers, our faculty, our staff, uh, because it'd be very difficult to hit that sensor button when something is being broadcast live, as our meetings are live streamed. So that's the consideration. And I'm open to the discussion. And if there is a mechanism where we can um, protect our children and our employees, but I would still err on the side of, of protecting them, and but allowing the public that easy, unfettered access, I think is what's important. Okay, thank you. Dr. Jenkins. So I thought of an example without being too specific um, where someone stood at the podium and actually uh, talked and, and quoted Scott Howitt around uh, what we said about our one mill. It was inaccurate. No ability for Scott to run down front and say that's not accurate. He actually caught the individual outside and they sort of brushed it aside because it had already been said in the meeting. Thankfully, that wasn't broadcast because it was inappropriate, inaccurate around uh, what we do and what we earn with our one mill. But in that instance, uh, our chief communications officer was misquoted. And it was uh, detrimental regarding our one mill, which our community supported at 84%. So for someone to say something inaccurate around the one mill was highly inappropriate, but had it been televised, I, I suppose if it, if it had been televised, Mr. Howitt probably would, would have run down front <laughs> to stop it because it was inaccurate and, and inappropriate. And when he caught the individual out front, they sort of brushed it aside, um, haven't heard a retraction or anything by that individual. But that's an example of misinformation, whether intentional or accidental, uh, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, but how do you correct it once it's actually stated? So it, it, it's, it, it's probably something worth con consideration. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave us on this note on this subject. Um, like so many things, something that sounds simple has, has ramifications. And I think it, as Dr. Jenkins just said, I think it behooves all of us to just think through that before before making a decision, a final decision. It, I think I always go back to, and I don't know how many of you all have read, it's one of my favorite books, Start With Why. Uh, on every decision, I always go back to why. And the, the issue here, why was it personally important to me for people to be able to comment on things we were gonna vote on? Why? Because it was important to our board to be informed. N it, it wasn't about people having an opportunity to say things that weren't true. It wasn't about people having a forum um, funded by taxpayer dollars to say anything that was unfair or un untrue and unfair. Um, but it was very important 
that we had the opportunity to hear from people on things that we were going to vote on or things that maybe we weren't going to vote on, but we should know about because maybe we should be voting on them. We did what we did in Orange County, which was create just create that form at the beginning of our meeting. Orange County Public Schools took a different approach. I see value in both. I, I see the value of protecting our students and our teachers from unfair, untrue accusations. And I will tell you there were many occasions when the things that I heard people say by the time I was able to get the information turned out not to be true. And it was too late in a meeting or a week or two later to even come back and try to correct it. So that's where I struggle with this issue. Um, and that's where I felt like the school district had found the sweet spot, if you will, in making sure that information is available. It's transparent in the sense that you can get to it. It's not as convenient, um, but it does give the school district enough time to research and determine whether that information is accurate. Um, and I think that's important for our employees and for our children. So recognizing those dueling competing interests, which is what we're going to spend a lot of time every week dealing with, is those competing interests, the competing interests of our children having extra time to sleep and the money that it costs and the disruption to the rest of their schedule, competing interests. It's always, there's not a right and a wrong, there's competing interests and it's us left to try to find that sweet spot in the competing interests. So with that, we have no further comments. No, nope. Member Gould, you're gonna close us out. You're gonna take us home for the evening. Amber Gould, you recognize. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I have a suggestion that, okay. that because we are a new working body just getting in our groove, so to speak, is that we continue to operate as we do right now and revisit this in six months. Because I think six months of meeting, six months of seeing how the testimonial part works, taking all those factors that we just had discussion on and kind of then benchmarking them against the, how it all works, I, I think would be valuable. I think that's an excellent idea. Okay. All right, without further discussion then, uh, anything further to come before the board? Dr. Jenkins, anything further before we adjourn for the evening? We, uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all for being here with us.